Hello, everyone. This is Roger Marsh for Family Talk, and I have some exciting news to share. A generous donor has made a $200,000 matching grant to help carry us into the summer. That means that any gift we receive between now and May 31st will be matched dollar for dollar up to $200,000, thanks to this generous matching grant. Dr. Dobson has been fighting for the family for over 40 years, and he's not about to stop now. You can make your donation securely online when you visit drjamesdobson.org. If you prefer, You can find out how to pledge your support by phone when you call 877-732-6825. Won't you please consider joining us in equipping twice as many families with your tax-deductible donation? Again, the toll-free number to call is 877-732-6825. Thank you for your prayers and your financial support of the ministry of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Today on Family Talk. Research by George Barna has revealed that men are attending church less and less and are thereby neglecting their responsibilities as godly heads of their families. This problem stems deeper than just men being uninterested in Sunday morning services. It reveals that churches are not doing enough to engage and disciple men to grow and mature in their walks with God. Welcome to Family Talk with your host, psychologist and best-selling author, Dr. James Dobson. I'm Roger Marsh, and I'm excited today to bring you a classic interview that Dr. Dobson conducted almost 15 years ago. It involves a conversation with four men who are heavily involved in ministering to other men. First up is Dr. Dobson's cousin, Reverend H.B. London, who currently serves as pastor of Friendship Church in Sun City, Palm Desert, California. Next is Chris Van Brocklin, the director of No Regrets Men's Ministries and founder of the organization Men with a Purpose. Also part of the broadcast is Vince Dacchioli, founder and president of On Target Ministries. The last guest joining Dr. Dobson is Patrick Morley, who is the president of the National Coalition of Men's Ministries and also the founder, chairman, and CEO of Man in the Mirror Incorporated. Today, this panel will discuss why men have a negative view of church and what can be done to change those ideas. It's coming up right now on this edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. We seem to be losing the battle for the hearts and minds of men, and I know you all have an absolute passion uh, to uh, minister to men and make them um, the individuals that God wants them to be. Um, is that a fair assessment? Pat, you were in my off both all of you were in my office a few minutes ago, and you said you don't think that's a fair statement that we're losing the battle. Well, there is a battle. It's a battle for men's souls, and it's raging all around us. But it's a battle that we can win. Not only that, it's a battle we have to win. So I would just say we cannot, we must not, and by God's grace, we're not going to lose this battle. Jesus said, go and make disciples. And I think if we as the church will get back to the core mission of making disciples, and especially of men, because that's where we're so weak right now, I do think that this is a battle that is a winnable winnable one. H, do you think we're losing the battle? Well, I think that fewer men are attending church than ever before. And I think that in many ways, the church does not appear to be relevant to their specific needs. And I think part of that is there's a huge feminization in the church that I think we're all dealing with. And I'm not sure that all the worship and all the songs and everything that goes in church that men just automatically relate to. If men don't have a relationship with their pastor or with somebody within the church structure that they can identify or call or call upon, then they're looking for something to attract them and to attach them to the local church. And I don't think a lot of men have that. A lot of women have it because women's Bible studies are everywhere. But you 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 announce a men's Bible studies and you'll have a hard time getting guys to attend. Uh, H, uh, you have been talking to me about this subject mm-hmm. and this problem for a long, long time, and you've had an influence on me. And uh, you were a pastor for 32 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was back in the 70s when you first said to me that you considered the outreach to men to be the most important thing you were doing and that you had a meal with a different man one-on-one every day of the week. Explain what you were saying to me. You're impressed that I remembered that. Well, you know, my first two churches were pretty well dominated by women, and that's 
no big accusation except that the guys just let them dominate. Yeah. And so when I got to Salem, Oregon, it dawned on me as a young pastor that my greatest advantage would be to invest in men and found later on in these statistics just a few weeks ago that where a man comes to know Christ, 97% of the time, the whole family follows. So it was an yeah. economy issue with me. And every day I met at lunch with men, but then for the next two or three hours, every afternoon, Monday through Friday and some on Saturdays, I invested myself in men. And remember when Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, he said, I want you to invest yourself in men, teach mm -hmm. them reliable, trustworthy men so they in turn can invest themselves in others. And I found that to be the recipe for a very growing, thriving church. Vince, you have uh, kind of redirected your li life in the last 10 years to devote yourself to men. Why did you do that? Doctor, I came up in a, in a family that um, uh, it was pretty dysfunctional. I mean, we had a, I had a, a dad in the home, but my dad really didn't pay a lot of attention to me, never played with me as a boy. Uh, I had some pretty bad role models in my family. I, I, I say occasionally to audiences, I actually had, coming from an Italian background, I actually had an Uncle Louie. <laughs> and uh, my Uncle Louis uh, was busted by Ed Meese personally when Ed Meese was attorney general under Ronald Reagan. And those were the kind of role models that I tended to gravitate toward as I was growing up and really didn't recognize the need for anything more than that. And it wasn't until in my uh, early years of marriage, all of that ugly background began to catch up with me. And I, I basically crashed and burned and was about to lose my wife and my two precious little girls at that time and began to realize that I needed to, uh, to get some help and began attending a little church in Van Nuys, California, known as the Church on the Way, uh, a mutual friend of ours. No uh, longer little, is uh, it? No. <laughs> Pastor Jack Hayford, um, uh, was, I was able to get underneath the, him, and he mentored me. He's one of my dearest friends to this day. If it hadn't been for him, uh, Dr. Dobson, I don't know where I would be today. Did he reach out to you in the same way HB was reaching out to the men of his yes, church? Yes, he did, it, and he did it uh, in, a, in a more corporate way, and then later on we became uh, closer, and we had a close mm -hmm. personal relationship. Uh, but I remember, in fact, when you were just talking a moment ago, HP, I remember Pastor Jack says, even today to audiences of pastors, he says the two most important thing, things that any pastor can do in their church is to, one, lead his congregation in worship. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't mean by that, of course, that ne they necessarily have to get up and sing, but that worship is a key. And uh, his idea is the reason why oftentimes we don't have a lot of power today is because we've lost the heart and oftentimes the art even of worship. And then he said, and the other thing is to lead his men in spiritual growth and development. Mm. And, and that what has happened, the great expansion of his ministry has happened. And you can point to men all over the nation has been the result of him mentoring men and helping yeah. them come to an understanding of who Jesus really well, is. Well, here are the statistics that um, make pretty clear what the need is. There are 108 million men in America, 15 or older, 66 million of them do not know Christ. Mm. Only six million men have had any kind of discipleship in their life at all. There's 72 million children under 18, and 33% of them will go to bed in a home without a biological father. In 1992, 42% of American men attended church regularly. Now, by 1997... Just five years later, that number was only 28. What's well, you know, going on? <clears throat> it's uh, rather ironic that these statistics spin out of that time where we saw a promise keepers movement, a men's movement, seemed to surface, at least in the media. It was on all of the periodicals. Yeah. And yet these statistics showing the fallout of the number of men seems to be uh, opposite, uh, going against each other. And yet that is uh, what's been happening. I Why do you think men stay home on Sunday? Well, the men's movement impressed me in the stadiums and so on as being something that created some great momentum. But the, uh, the ability to be able to harness that and carry it over the long term has not uh, happened. I uh, re respond back to those kinds of activities as kind of spiritual heart surgery without the rehab, meaning uh, that if yeah. there isn't something as follow-up, if there aren't strategic things that are taking place for men in their lives to help them keep their promises on the backside, then that has a lot to do with it. And, and I think what that causes is uh, some real disappointment 
And when, you, when a man is disappointed once or twice, men do not like to fail. And I think that uh, once they have had a couple of failure experiences connected with their own spirituality and then connecting that with what they see at their local church, they avoid those. Let's key off what H.P. said. Do you all see church? Do you think men see church uh, as a largely feminine uh, dominated activity? Uh, something that a real man wouldn't want to be involved in? Uh, I, my personal sense is that they, they may not necessarily articulate it that way, but the sense that they have when they go to church is that it oftentimes is not relevant for them. Mm-hmm. Promise Keepers had something. I don't know where this quote came from, but I first heard it from Promise Keepers leadership, and they said that with men, distance equals safety. Uh, we tend to not want yeah. to be known for who we really are. And relationships, even though we need them and desire them, are hard for us. And uh, when men come to church, um, I read this in a book not too long ago, that oftentimes men are suffering from what we call moral schizophrenia. So they come to church on Sunday, and they tend to do the head nod. Yes, pastor, great sermon, that's wonderful stuff. And then when they go to work Monday, uh, it may call for them, that truth may call for them to be uncompromising in in ways that could cause them to lose their job, could cause them to not get that promotion. And so they're intimidated. They're not sure what to do. And oftentimes they're not deeply enough rooted in the things of the Lord, discipled in a, in a way in a way that can cause them to have the confidence and faith to step out. Well, so, I've got a little different uh, approach on this. I, I agree with this, but what we see happening a lot, and I know this happened in my own family. My father grew up in a home with a single mom. And she did a great job, but there were tremendous sacrifices. They grew up in poverty. So when dad came up, you know, he went to work when he was six years old on a six. bread, six yeah. years old, <laughs> had to go to work at six years old yeah. on a bread truck, got up at three o'clock oh. with his older brother. Uh, and then they had a paper route and then they had a permanent tardy slip to school. And so my dad went to work when he was six years of age. Well. When he became a man, he had to decide whether he would break the cycle or repeat the cycle. And I thank God that he had the passion, the desire to break the cycle. So I'm the oldest of four boys. Well, mom and dad decided they should put us into a church for religious and moral instruction. Now, my dad had an incredible work ethic because of growing up in this environment. And when the church found out that he was a worker, uh, they put him to work. They had a vision, our church had a vision to put my dad to work, but our church did not also have a vision to help my dad to become a godly man, a godly husband, and a godly father. He wanted to, but our church didn't have the vision to equip him to do that. And so the bottom line is, is that he really worked very hard. But when he, he worked so hard, when he by the time he was 40 years of age, my dad was the top layman in our church. But he just burnt out, and we left the church. I was in the 10th grade. My youngest brother was in the 3rd grade. Uh, the wheels sort of fell off the wagon after that. If my dad was here today, he died a couple of years ago, he would tell you that he made the decision, and he's responsible. I appreciate and respect that. But nevertheless, I, I quit high school. My next brother quit high school. He eventually died of a heroin overdose. Mm. My next brother has had employment problems all of his life, and my youngest brother is a recovering drug addict and recovering alcoholic and is divorced. And I would just, I would just say that uh, I, I believe, I don't want to be indelicate, but I believe that the church is culpable. I wish the audience could see a picture of my dad. He's just the sweetest man you've ever known. He didn't want to fail, but the church used him to do the work, but they did not help him become a disciple. Disciple. And there was no men's ministry at that time. There was no men's ministry. You know, Jim, as as, as Pat and Vince and Chris talk, it takes me back to my, (laughs) my pastoring days because... You know, I'd ask a lot of these guys who would be coming to church, and all of a sudden they'd drop out of church. And I'd invested big time in them, and it just mm-hmm. broke my heart a lot mm-hmm. of times. And I'd go to them, and I'd, I'd ask them, I said, why aren't you coming? And they would say to me two things nearly every time. One, it doesn't seem relevant to me. And two, I don't have time. They'd mm-hmm. use those two excuses. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, as I think about that, 
see, I, I know that we're in this big worship experience. Vince talked about it. But I look out at audiences and places where I go to preach nearly every Sunday and where you're having standing up worshiping for 30 to 40 minutes. I watch a lot of guys drop out of the singing thing because they just get tired of the singing. Mm -hmm. They want to get on with it. And then if they can't apply what they receive to their day-to-day -day activities, and if their wives are more spiritually mature, and if the children mm -hmm. go to their wives for spiritual guidance, but then the other thing that I see is that a lot of these dads have had a terrible relationship with their father, and the church represents an authority mm -hmm. figure, and it makes them tough because they've got to deal with these feelings that they have yeah. toward their dad or, or someone else. Are those solvable problems, H? Well, I, I mean, mean I, how do you make uh, uh, Sunday morning and uh, all church services relevant to a guy who doesn't perceive <laughs> the gospel is somehow relevant to you? You know, I remember an old retired pastor who just gave me fits. I could never, ever, ever satisfy him. And I preached this one mighty message one Sunday thinking that this was it, man. He, he had to come out just glowing over this. <laughs> and he walked out and looked me in the face, didn't even shake my hand or anything, and just uttered two words that's, that changed my ministry. He said, so what? <laughs> You're kidding me. <laughs> and, what? and I wanted to punch him out right there in the forehead, but I knew that wouldn't look very good. And I sat there and I said, you know, Lord, he made sense. What if I took 30 minutes of 2,000 people's time this morning? What if other people are saying, so what? Mm -hmm. And I began to put the so what template to everything I did as a pastor. And I really do think that pastors have got to look at men through this filter of the so what template. What are we teaching them? What are we saying? What are we requiring of them? Are we really answering any of their questions? And if we're not, then we've got to make some alterations. Yeah. Can I respond to that and yeah. just say that uh, painting a, 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 a picture of a church that you walk into where you see men who are engaged. That's what's been intriguing to me. Yeah. And I have discovered at least two or three. <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty more. But just, just in the last few months, I have um, developed relationships with churches where the men are very engaged. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you took a look statistically, they're working in the same numbers uh, in the nurseries and the Sunday schools and the youth ministries as the women. Uh, it's pretty evenly divided. And I also notice as I approach those churches that those are the guys who are there greeting and, and just uh, laying down their lives to help the church and make the church work. These churches have discovered not just how to help men learn how to work, as was described by Pat, but the reason for that. And what they've done is they discipled these men effectively. And now these men are responding to that, I would say, the word in gratitude yeah. for what's happened in their lives. But what those churches have done for them, Chris, they've given a meaningful work to do. There's sure. significance mm -hmm. to them standing in the foyer or, sure. or working with the children. They, they feel yes. a part of it. There's ownership. If a man doesn't find ownership in the body of Christ, he'll, he'll stand in the background. He'll stand in the shadows. You're right. There's a whole new uh, way, too, of thinking about ministry to men that needs to take place. We're, we're here, listeners, we're here representing the National Coalition of Men's Ministries. And all of the 80 different organizations representing over 50% of all the churches in the United States. So this is a very huge <laughs> movement that we're yeah. representing here today. And, and we're here to tell you that we need a new paradigm, a new model for ministry to men in the church. And we call it all-inclusive men's ministry. If you have 100 men in your church, what is the size of your men's ministry? If you have six guys meeting on Wednesday morning at 630, is that your men's ministry? If you have... 14 uh, white-haired men uh, eating burned pancakes once a month. Is that your ministry? <laughs> Let me tell you, if you have 100 men in your church, the size of your men's ministry is 100 men. That's right. You need to have an intentional plan to disciple every willing male in your church. That's what men's ministry is. It's not, it's not some... And a lot of times what the pastor does is he has this idea, if I can get one small group going of six guys, then I can check men's ministry off my to-do list once so check forever forgotten well the bottom line is you still have 94 other men who are languishing who are tired they're exhausted and they think the message that the church is bringing uh, Jesus is bringing is come unto me all you who are weary and burdened and I'll give you more work to do <laughs> <laughs> what do you suppose drew men to Jesus he went after the men yeah, he, he was a man's man 
And he simply called them and said, mm-hmm. follow me. And they came. Mm-hmm. What did he say to them that we don't say? One word. I can tell you it's one word, Dr. Dobson. What drew men to Jesus was love. And where I have seen the most effective ministry to men in our nation and churches, that is the key. It's where they feel love, they feel accepted, uh, they feel special, and that draws them. And I've, I can't tell you how many times I have not found that in many churches. It tends to distill down into mechanics and programs. But I really believe that, that men are... The good news is I really believe that men today, and, and in studies that have been done with young men particularly, that they really are looking for uh, truth and relevancy. But I believe the key is where there's love, where there are people reaching out to them. And, and I'd be very surprised, Chris, and in many of the cases that you mentioned earlier, if the, the senior pastor wasn't playing a key role, by Absolutely. the way, in this area. Mm-hmm. And I find that to be very, very important. Right. I'm sure, HB, in your, in your ministry as well, mm-hmm. that the senior pastor is intimate involvement with calling out to the men of his church saying, I love you, you are special, you're special in Jesus' eyes, and gathering them in. I I have found that those are some of the most effective ministries to men. We're really just getting going, and there's so much here. This is such an important issue, and we're going to have to deal with it on another day. And uh, in fact, we'll deal with it on this day. Uh, We will continue to talk about this subject, and we'll air it next time. Uh, In the meantime, thank you all for what you're doing, for your passion for God's work. And um, I hear a certain uh, optimism in your voices, despite the... Uh, difficulties that are going on. Is is that accurate? <clears throat> or is that, Pat, that's kind of where we started. Do you, oh, you, I'm just so fired up. I'm mm-hmm. just so fired up about it. Do you know that in Martin Luther's Reformation that 50% of all the churches in Europe became Protestant in just 40 years? Can you imagine what would happen in America if we could get our hands around a discipleship Reformation in this generation? Oh, it's so exciting. And men Men is the place to focus. All right. To our listeners, stay tuned till tomorrow. We're going to tell you how to do that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Don't go anywhere. And we will uh, we'll just pick up right where we left off. Great. Okay. Thank Thanks you so much, Dr. Dobson. <laughs>An incredibly candid discussion on the need for spiritual leadership from men today on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org to find out more information about the various books these men have written and the ministries that they are a part of. Again, that's drjamesdobson.org and then hit the broadcast tab. If you've appreciated the conversations on today's broadcast or would like to share how they've impacted you, let us know by calling our listener feedback line at 877-732-6825. You can also share your testimony, give us your thoughts on our ministry, or provide us with broadcast suggestions as well. Again, the number to call for Family Talks listener feedback line is 877-732-6825. As we wrap up this program, please keep in mind that we currently have a matching grant in place going on from now until the end of the month. That means that every dollar you donate to our ministry will be doubled. So you can call toll-free with your contribution at 877-732-6825. Or if you'd like to make a donation through our secure website, visit drjamesdobson.org. Thanks so much for your prayers, your financial support, and thanks for listening today. Be sure to come back again tomorrow to hear the remainder of Dr. Dobson's discussion with this panel of experts on what can be done to better reach the men in this country for Jesus. That's coming up next time on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh. Have a blessed day. Family Talk is not associated with Focus on the Family. How do people often come to you asking for advice, direction in life, maybe prayer over tough issues? Could be about their marriage, maybe about their children, maybe a tough issue that they're facing right now. If that's you, have you ever thought about going back to school or furthering your education? 
I'm so excited to tell you about a brand new center that has just started at the world's most exciting university, Liberty University. Hi, this is Dr. Tim Clinton, president of the American Association of Christian Counselors and executive director of the Center for Counselor Education and Family Studies at Liberty. We have partnered up with world-renowned psychologist, marriage and family expert, Dr. James Dobson, to create the James C. Dobson Center for Child Development, Marriage and Family at Liberty. But here's what's most important. We now have three programs of study coming out of that center where you can, regardless of major, uh, doesn't matter what you're studying, whether you're gonna go into psychology, business, science, or what have you, you can now get a minor from the James C. Dobson Center online and become a certified marriage and family relationship coach while you're going to college. Yes, you can. While you're going to graduate school too, regardless of what you're studying, God has opened up a door here that's so unique. To learn more, just simply go to liberty.edu forward slash Dobson. You'll find out everything you need to know. I can't believe God has opened up this door and brought Liberty University and Dr. James C. Dobson together to offer this program. I hope you go there, Liberty University. It's liberty.edu forward slash Dobson.